So my name is Eric Testall. I'm a biostatistician. I'm not a perfusionist, although I work with some really great perfusionists at specialty care. And I wanted to put together a talk to kind of address a little bit of a, a question that came up in the midst of a paper. You know, sometimes we get a lot of data and we, we do lots of things with it, right? We want to work on quality. We want to work on research. Um, so in the process of, of one of these research papers, you know, you send it in and reviewers look at it and you have some back and forth. There was a particular comment that stood out to me. We were talking about some blood management technique and to me now this was long enough ago, I should remember exactly which one, but the point was, the reviewer said, you know, this combination that you're looking at, these techniques in concert, no one really does that. No one does that and, and so don't, don't worry about that. Don't worry about that. And so. You know, as a statistician, when someone says, you know, don't worry about that, or, you know, here's, here's how it is, I, I kind of want to see some data behind it. So, so it occurred to me that maybe it would be useful to just take a look and see um, if we can answer some basic questions about where these techniques uh, are heading, um, what combinations they're being used in, and, and see if there's some, some interesting pattern to, to kind of either back up or refute what this reviewer was saying. Hey, you know, don't, don't worry about that particular um, application. Please don't have to don't mute your visual. Okay. So blood management is a very important cornerstone of uh, perfusion practice. Um, you know, the physiological basis of, of all these techniques are very well worked out in the literature. We have volumes of knowledge about, uh, you know, reasons to do them, their effects. Um, we can look at randomized trials. We can look at observational studies. Uh, but as a non-perfusionist, as a statistician, you know, a little bit, I think I can play a role of, of you know, posing the question a, l a little bit differently. So um, while we might know exactly some of the effects on, on people's physiology of these, you know, what is the overall epidemiology? It's another way to get at what this reviewer was saying. You know, what are the patterns of usage? Is there a sociology of these practices, you know? Um, so maybe I'll take another couple of slides to try and convince you that these, these are, are worthwhile ways to pose the question. Um, so if we have this, this kind of a, a statement, you know, what's the evidence to support that? You know, I think a lot of times uh, in my, my own work, uh, I use certain techniques, I'm aware of the discussion, you know, such and such has uh, got a limitation, this particular tool, and you know, you know, in some circles that's, a, that's sort of off limits, you know, some people are stopping to use that. Um, you hear a lot of these things when you go to meetings, but you know, is that the extent to which we want to understand the field or is, is there another tool? So, um, so here we're going to use some data uh, from the SCOPE, uh, Specialty Care Operative Procedural Registry, to, to try and pro probe a little bit of this. Um, a, a related idea that, that makes me think, you know, maybe we can learn something by digging into uh, how people are using tools out there is, um, it, it relates to something that we did a couple of years ago, and that was to look at uh, the effect of a method on its own in isolation. It's very common to study things in isolation. You want to know like the enduring impact of, of um, a particular technique versus you know, understanding something in context. So uh, here was some work that we did to try to see what happens when patients may get both ANH and RAP. You know, for some folks, that might sound like a strange thing to do, but it turns out that if you look across the country and the hundreds of hospitals that we work in, that's something that some people do. So we thought, well, you know, maybe we can say something uh, about the effect of doing something like that. And so you're going to see along the horizontal axis um, a model output of um, the uh, first hematocrit on bypass for uh, certain autologous prime volumes, so as you go to the right, these are people getting more prime, and on the vertical axis, you have an A and H volume. Um, and so you're going to see, you know, in red, people who are more diluted, uh, in green, people who are having less dilution. Um, th these things aren't necessarily linear. There are kind of some unexpected interactions between these two methods, depending on exactly how you use it, right? So you want to keep your patient in the green according to what this statistical model is telling us. And, uh, and there are a couple of ways to do it. So not to belabor the point and get into a, a different topic, but just to kind of set the stage to say, these tools, while we might really focus on how they work in, in isolation, we should see a little bit more of the context around them. 
And while some indications uh, may be obvious and some practice patterns may be obvious from the way these methods are developed, people are doing a lot of different things in the field. So, so let's take a look. All right, so how will we do it? Um, normally, when I give a talk, I have charts like these and p-values and lots of tables that are really big, but this is gonna be a little different. This is gonna be some exploratory data analysis. Um, there are some other terms for this. Uh, very popular is data journalism. Um, you know, this is essentially having a general uh, set of questions and using data to see, are there new hypotheses that we can generate? Is there some story that we should be aware of? Um, so how does this relate to formal research? Well, I sort of uh, touched on that just now. Um, we're in traditional research, a lot of times, you know, practitioners are working, they see something, they say, maybe that's unexpected, or there's some particular phenomenon that they're trying to avoid or uh, make happen more often. Uh, it begins in practice, right? The things that you see every day uh, when you're working. Um, but there are some things that you don't see every day, like national practice patterns. Who's, who sees that, right? I mean, that's not something any one of us could interact with on a regular basis. Um, so we need something else to help us have that same, gee, that's interesting moment, that hypothesis generating kind of moment. Oh, I didn't expect that. Maybe we should look into that a little further. So exploratory data analysis, visualizing your data, kind of playing with your data. It, it's a way to help you kind of expand uh, your thinking about a topic, see new directions to head in, and maybe set your priorities. Maybe say, you know what, I didn't realize so many people were doing such and such a topic or, or such a combination of practices. Maybe we should look into that and see what the effects are and see if they're having better results or worse. So, uh, so as I mentioned, the data I'll show, I'll show you come from SCOPE. Um, that's the specialty care registry. Um, on the perfusion service line, we have uh, about 185,000 open heart procedures across the vast majority of the United States, um, uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 130 data fields per case, and um, uh, you know, really a focus on the intraoperative space. Um, we also have other things that we look at with our other service lines, so, so we're in the business of, of uh, collecting a lot of procedural data and, um, and using it to learn. So let's look at some data already. Uh, since it's the last session of the day, and as you are all so brave and um, not outside in the warm sunshine, I figure maybe we could make this uh, a slightly more interactive session. So maybe uh, I'll have some shows of hands or people can kind of make some guesses. I'm gonna set it up where we'll see a graph, but before I show you the data, maybe I can call on a few people. They'll say what they think the pattern might be. Um, so we have trends uh, over the last four years, so recent data on each of these three techniques uh, across regions of the United States. You can get very complicated with regions. Is Northeast the same as Mid-Atlantic? And you know, I'm from the Midwest and that's almost always that same red blob up there, but I'm just gonna use four regions to keep it simple. Um, maybe people in the West will be offended by just everything out there, but uh, you, have to t you have to, you know, Occam's razor, right? You have to keep it simple where you can. Uh, so we can also look by procedure type. Um, We'll look at some combinations of techniques, as I mentioned, and then combinations within regions. We could pile variable on top of variable, make it very complicated, but we'll just, we'll just take this level and see if we, we can find something. So, as I mentioned, um, I, I think it might be fun if people wanna just comment on some of the things. We'll, we'll look at the data, we'll see if there are any surprises. You know, as an outsider, uh, I, I can say some things that I think are interesting patterns, but that's nothing compared to the wealth of experience that's in this room, so, um, so here we go things that seem interesting that you might not have predicted. That's what we wanna do. Okay, so let's do the first one. This is gonna be very simple. Um, we'll look at each of these techniques, look at their use over time. Now forget for a second the idea that you can use maybe two techniques on the same patient. This is just gonna be a question of like, did you use it or not, right? So uh, does anyone wanna venture a guess for rap? What shape is that line gonna be if you go across the years? Is it kind of flat? Is it gonna be like going up like crazy? Going down? How about somebody on this table? Going up, exactly. Everyone knows this. It's fun, see? 
So, so okay, yeah, so RAP's going up. But it's not going up constantly, right? And we'll see some places where it's going up to different degrees. It's not uniform, but over the whole country, we see, yes, it's going up, and maybe it's leveling off, right? Maybe we found all those patients that this is appropriate to use for. You know, I'm just looking at the very outs you know, outside view. Uh, there would be a lot of reasons that you could, you could test for an explanation as to why we've got that particular shift. But it has grown. Um, ultrafiltration. Some growth, a little flatter. We'll have some more to say about that in the next slides. Some very interesting patterns. How about ANH? Anybody on this half of the room want to guess what's going on with ANH over the last four years? How about in Linda? Up, big up. No. <laughs> going down. So we can see some of these things going in the opposite direction, right? We've got RAP going up, we've got ANH going down gently, ultrafiltration up a little. Okay, let's try another one. Let's look at regions. Maybe this will be interesting. So uh, as I mentioned before, we got that simplized, uh, simplified map in the United States. Um, let's just look at RAP, see what we've got. Okay. So. So what do you see? It's, it's going up everywhere, but not exactly to the same degree. It's not starting in the same place either, right? It looks like the west is starting a little lower than the other regions uh, and growing in sort of a way to catch up. Just as a way of background, th this is the percentage of patients within each region, right? So um, here we're still talking about all comers. So okay, so what's the story with ultrafiltration? Well, all right, well, now we'll skip to, we'll, we'll show it off. Uh, ultrafiltration is kind of funny because in some places it's actually, you know, it's used a, a bit more than others. So in the east it looks like it's a bit more popular, just in general. Uh, in the south, quite a bit less popular, uh, but they're all growing a bit, or maybe similar to what we saw on the last graph, right? Kind of undulating, growing a little. How about A and H? This one is one that I thought was pretty interesting. So nationally, you have a slight decline, right? So people are starting to move away from that a bit. But where's that decline most dramatic? So it's not in the West. They seem to be holding steady. Midwest. So, so the practice pattern in the Midwest is to really start to move away from A and H. And I think you know, that, you know, that combined with the East, those, those are the two regions that are driving that national trend. So we might, we might want to know something about their patient mix. We might want to know something about uh, what they're discussing at the regional meetings. Uh, is there some consensus that they're arriving at as a, as a group up there that says, you know, maybe we're changing our approach to this? Any, any comments or observations? Any, is this any of this surprising to anyone? Want to offer a, yes. Why rap? So that that is such a great observation. Uh, we'll come to a little bit more just on that. Yeah. That's another great set of questions I did not delve into for this. So sorry. Sorry. Just looking at I think uh, Del Nido is starting to make its way more into the adult population. And if I know this has happened at our center, so we're now finding ourselves having to use hemo concentrators more often. Okay. Okay, so a relation. So maybe some of the grids right here need to be cardioplegia type. And we can see where your Del Nido's taking off. You're having a big change. Down because RAP is trending up and they're diametrically opposed. I mean, if you draw off blood before you RAP, you're shooting yourself in the foot. Okay. That that would be good. I'll keep that in mind. If I ever become a perfusionist, I will not do that. <laughs> so this is the problem with a statistician. I can come up with things that you guys are saying. Oh no no Eric, don't don't look there. That's but that's why I have Alan Linda. Okay. So so is any other comments or observations on on this set? Okay. No. I oh uh, yes, I'm sorry. In the back.
We have, a, we have a couple of different cardioplegia uh, possibilities at our establishment, and I'm in the East. Um, we have Custodial, we have Del Nido, we have 4 to 1 Buckberg, um, and when we do ultrafiltration, it's usually on our Del Nido, because you give a lot more. 4 to 1 is, you know, you're not diluting out. As far as your wrap, um, we do it pretty much every case. Um, also, we used to go on with a dry venous line at one place, but that, that has since gone away. Um, but we still don't like to give that, uh, if we do not wrap, we don't, we don't like to give that initial bullet when we initiate bypass of crystalloid. You know, it's definitely not a, uh, a good outcome for the patient. I don't, I don't think you're doing them any justice by giving that, that bullet of crystalloid on initiation. So, so more to think about with cardioplegia and the more to look at. This is where uh, often this exercise leads to some questions and then you want to say, well, yes, but what about this? So, so you know, the other way to start is just to do a huge statistical model. It, so, that, you know, there are two ways to get at this. And I like this one. This is more fun because then I think the hypotheses we come up with will be a little better. We'll start to look in the right place with our model. There are a million ways to go wrong with the model. So this is a little more foolproof. Did you... Um, look at any of the regions as far as starting hematocrits and hedge that up against what they're doing here? Yeah, yeah. One of the graphs coming up will we'll look at drift uh, by these techniques, but not drift within region. So I, I, I tried to make the assumption that uh, drift wasn't going to be something people in the West were treating totally different than in the East or something. But what's your Well, I'm just style? saying that... Uh, I work in Fayetteville, North Carolina, and I got to say after 20-something plus years of doing perfusion, I don't think I've seen a sicker population. We oftentimes have people that come off the street, homeless, hematocrits of 23 and less. You know, ultimately, transfusion can't be avoided. We try to avoid it, but um, it's really difficult. That's why I was just asking you about regions within the country okay. that may have poor population t to choose from and operate on. Okay. So, so m sicker patients, people starting in a, in a worse place uh, on their hematocrit. So um, just trying to scan the room. Since we're, okay. So maybe we'll go on to the next set of graphs. Uh, let's look at procedures. Um, let's see. Okay, yeah, I remember now. I, I, I put. I, I was trying to remember which way I revealed them in. And so, um, let's see. Uh, could I get maybe the, the back and the left has had fewer. So is there some brave person on the left who wants to say something about one of these for aortic surgery? Is is like, is there anything to report? Aortic surgery is is one of the categories we just happen to have available. And I might not even pick the most interesting one. Okay, I have no takers. Let me show you guys. All right, well then forget it. It was a different graph where I do it one by one. Okay, so same pattern here. We see increases. Um, unfortunately, we do have an other category. It's just a big giant mixed bag of everything you don't see named. Um, we layer on ultrafiltration. Okay, maybe some interesting differences starting to show up across these procedures, at least relatively, right? In some of them, uh, it seemed to be about equally exchangeable, at least for a time. The combined AVMV um, uh, aortic surgery, but certainly not for cabbage. And then rates of ANH in these. So th this was a little uh, less intriguing to me, although I don't know if others in the audience have a particular comment about procedure type. Um, I think we might skip ahead a little bit. Um, so here, I, I was just kind of curious to show, you know, um, overall, what do we get when we look at all the combinations of these methods? This is where I think I was surprised the most. Um, you know, like I mentioned before, a lot of times you just want to look and see, you know, me as a researcher statistician, you know, does this method work? So I'm going to test this method. And yeah, I'm going to control for all the other things, right? I'm going to control for the starting hematocrit and the age of the patient and the procedure type. But, 
you know, how, how well do I understand how these things are working in concert? So the first question is, is how often are these things being used together? Um, you know, across the top we see, well, there's your rap with only rap. We didn't use any other technique. This one to me was a bit of a surprise. Ultrafiltration on its own, maybe not that common. So uh, ANH on its own, very rare. So that's a bit lower. So how might we explain that? Well, we start to look at some of the other combinations. ANH together with rap. Hmm. Okay, not that common. Not changing a whole lot. Ah, here's where most of our ultrafiltration is coming in. It's we're using ultrafiltration and wrap. And it's growing the most. So if we see that ultrafiltration is sort of holding steady or maybe growing a little on the whole, it's really, I think, due mostly to this category right here. You'll see A and H and ultrafiltration. That's nothing. So this is a popular combination. And I'm not sure if this is something that's on everyone's radar screen or, you know, if my limited exposure to your literature it hasn't featured much discussion of this. Any? So we've got uh, having all three. That's uh, a possibility, and some people do that. Um, uh, it'd be interesting to, to know why. Does, does anyone in the room do all of these three methods together on a single patient? about maybe as common as the graph would suggest, not that common. <laughs> That's good, it's just we're validating the data right now. Uh, here's, here's one that I like a lot too. Uh, the number, the percent of cases that where you don't do anything has really gone down over time. So, so really the trend is people are doing something, whereas maybe there were some holdouts previously that weren't either on the, the bandwagon, they weren't sure which one they liked best. So, so there we have it. Okay, and this one, you know, I had all the cutesy like show you a little bit and take it away and ask you questions. Now let's just look at all the data. Let's look at a whole bunch of stuff at once. So here you can see the combinations of each thing. And I apologize, it's a bit of a mess. But I, I think if you take each color kind of one by one, you can kind of start to pick some things out. So, okay, w what's the most common thing in each region, right? Well, in three of the regions, the most common thing is wrap on its own. And in the West, it's become the trend to do wrap together with ultrafiltration. It's the most common thing. Um, we look at the incidence of people doing nothing. Uh, it's become a, a thing of the past in the West. Almost none of the cases don't do anything. Um, you know, they're all decreasing, but to different degrees. Uh, and then that interesting, you know, back to that wrap and ultrafiltration example, kind of the Kermit color in there. Uh, it's kind of coming up in all these places. It's, it's growing kind of equally across the country. So it might be a thing to, to look into. That, that's um, the kind of sense that I get from these graphs. Anybody else picking up something here? Any other aha moments possibly? Uh, surprises? I mean, it's probably not something you think all day about, but um, again, it's a chance to uh, take a peek. Yeah, that, that to me looks like ultrafiltration, sort of the third one down. Yeah, that looks like ultrafiltration to me, if I'm reading my colors correctly. Yeah. So, um, oh, so lastly, uh, I have just a comparison, you know, in a strict sense, we would really want to, like I said, do a big model, um, have a, a really thorough set of controls for the region and the hospital and the surgeon, um, acuity of the patient, the procedure and all these. But it's also sometimes instructive to just take a look at this sort of raw data. So each of these is a box plot. Um, and that, that's just to say that you've got this kind of summary of all the data points, uh, the data being your hematocrit drift from the first in the OR to uh, the nadir on bypass. And uh, so negative is, you know, it's, it's gone down, right, uh, for each of these methods. And uh, the middle line here on a block box plot, that's just the median. That's the middle patient in each one of those groups. So we're going to say, where's the middle going? You know, uh, for RAP, you know, you're losing, on average, about 10 points in that drift. Um, losing a bit more on the ANH, that's pretty predictable. Um, 
And to me, uh, you know, I, I think, again, we see another reason to maybe pay attention to this particular combination, this category right here, wrap and ultrafiltration. Uh, that one appears to have the, the smallest drift uh, amongst these patients. So, so that's a particular practice pattern that's on the rise. Um, it's the majority of, of where ultrafiltration is being used, and it seems to have a really good result. So this would kind of maybe beg some questions, just focus in a little bit more on that and see, you know, is, is that producing all of the, um, the kinds of things that we would expect and want from a blood management technique? Maybe also tellingly, uh, you know, of course, this is uncontrolled. The none category is also somewhat, um, well, maybe these are just, you know, healthier patients or something. I'm not sure. But none seems to fare a lot better than I would have predicted. <laughs> so maybe the people doing nothing, they know something. The rest, everyone else doesn't know. I, I don't know. <laughs> Again, a statistician could. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, a statistician can't tell you that answer. Um, so uh, to conclude, um, give you back some time in the day, just keep it a little bit short. Uh, exploratory data analysis, I think it can be a really great tool. It's a way to have a, gee, that's interesting moment, a kind of hypothesis generating moment, but on a big scale, you know? None of us can see all those cases across the country happening every day, but we get uh, a registry and we're able to follow things over a long enough period of time in enough places, we can start to get a sense of like where the field is moving uh, and what new things might need to be on our radar uh, for research and for quality um, and uh, for, you know, having the ability to put things in context. Um, blood management, as we can see uh, from all those wavy graphs, is dynamic. You know, you've got people making decisions in, you know, their regions, in their hospitals, in their companies, in their teams about the best way to go about things, never mind the entire literature on all these things. So there, there are a lot of moving parts to how people are doing perfusion. And um, you know, this is just one way for us to delve into that. And uh, yeah, and so, so this may be a, a jumping off point to uh, some of the questions that you all have posed and, and um, uh, sort of en routes to uh, developing some more sophisticated models from some of these questions. So thank you.